the first question, of course, is how uh, how are you doing in lockdown? Um, well, I mean, you know, last year uh, I coped fairly well. I would say or we coped fairly well, but it's getting a bit boring now. It's been a year. Huh? Mm. And um, as you know, Nikki, we've got a son with special needs and um, they locked down. He's in a care facility. They locked down early and hard. Uh, and for uh, the first month or two, the only access we were supposed to get was via things like Zoom or FaceTime. But, you know, he's he's registered blind and he doesn't do 2D screens. He doesn't get screens. Mm -hmm. um, so he could hear our voices, but that just confused him as to why he wasn't getting a cuddle. Yeah. So that yeah. didn't help at all. The good news was the weather was great. I don't know if you remember, if you can remember that far back. Yeah. But come the spring, it was pretty good. And so he was out in the garden of um, the compound where he stays. He was out in the garden quite a lot. And we said, well, look, what, can we come and look over the wall and just maybe glimpse him over the wall? Yeah. And staff then said, well, look, come around to the gate. There's a big kind of metal gate and you can sort of see him through the gate and stuff. So then we did, as a family, get to hang out. And that's still the case. Um, I mean, as you know, rules keep changing and rules in Scotland are different from rules in England, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. They, you know, they got to a stage where they said, well, look, you can come inside the gate and you can sit in the garden with them if you're wearing PPE. Um, then it was you can go into his bedroom in full PPE, but only one family member can do that. Yeah. Um, choose which family member you want to do it, yeah. which put a lot of onus on us and my wife and, and our other son and I thought, no, we'll just stick to what we've got, which is all three of us going and seeing them through the gate. Yeah. Um, and then at Christmas, it was, oh, he can come home for a few days. No, he can't come home. He can come home, but not stay overnight. Oh, yes, he can come home and stay overnight. Um, and eventually he did. We got him home for one night. So he was tested, came home, stayed the night, Christmas Eve, into Christmas Day, and then Christmas Day evening, we took him back again. He was tested again, and he was negative. That's the first tactile contact we really had with him. Yeah. Uh, and now we're back into lockdown again, and it's back to seeing them through the gate or over the wall. Yeah, which is, I don't, I think people who don't have um, either a child or a sibling um, with a profound learning disability, I, I don't think they quite understand really what that means, that lack of contact, because in Emily's case, particularly, she doesn't know why this is happening. She knows mm. that everyone around her wears a mask and she, she knows that all of the things that she loves can't happen anymore, but but it, it, it is difficult. What what do you think you'd want to say to people to sort of understand what what it's like for families and people with learning disabilities, either outside the pandemic, but particularly within it at the moment? Well, I, I think it's it's more it's more that the, the the learning disabled have been ignored by governments and by the media. So we keep being blithely told care homes are at the top of the list yeah. and everybody in care homes has been treated and you're, going, you're thumping the table going, no, they've not. Yeah. The, the most vulnerable have been treated. No, they've not. Yeah. The most vulnerable, as you and I know, are people with learning disabilities and they are, you know, my son has not been vaccinated yet. The over 60s in Scotland, 60 to 65-year-olds, perfectly healthy, 60 to 65-year-olds now being vaccinated. Yeah. Um, my son and the other people in his facility, no. Yeah. The carers have been vaccinated, which is great news. Mm. Um, the, the, the clients have yet to be vaccinated. And my son is in the same group as us. So he's in the 60 to 65. Yeah. He's in the same group as his mum and dad. And I just think that's wrong. I think the, the vulnerable, the clinically extremely vulnerable, um, should have been treated first. And we're told, yes, they are being treated. And you go, no, they're not, because they're learning disabled, they're being forgotten about. Yeah. And I mean, you know, my son, I mean, touch wood, Kit, he's, he's, he's very healthy, he's very robust, yeah. but there are people in his facility who are not and who are in and out of hospital and have been in and out of hospital down the years um, for various um, ailments and various uh, uh, treatments. And, you know, they've just been, seem to me, they've been forgotten about. And if the media don't talk about them and the politicians don't talk about them, we can't blame the general population for not knowing not that, they're not, that they're not being treated the way everybody else is. Yeah. And I think the other thing seems to be the way it's being applied. So it's almost as though what it needs is a standardized. So we have the tiers and it varies between almost between postcodes and almost between GPs, because in our case, we were very lucky that, that the GP 
called. But the way it works is there can be no advanced preparation. So Emily's very needle phobic. So she needs mm. advanced preparation. We can't give her too much because she'll start to get very nervous and we can't spring it on her. And yet the way the supply works is that obviously GPs have a fixed amount, which they have to then share. And the care home situation is different to community. So I think, and I don't know how you feel about this, but if there was a standardized sort of mm. approach coming out of the Department for, for Health or, you know, from each devolved government, that there would be a, a standardized place for learning disabled people within the tiers because as you say that there just there isn't at the moment well, I mean, we've not been told anything nobody has been in touch with us right. from anywhere to say this is when your son can expect to be given the job will he have to go to one of these big you know conference centers where everybody lines up and gets it will somebody come into the care home and, and give him a job will he have to go to his local gp practice we don't know and the carers don't know and let me you know the carers have been amazing yeah. The people looking after my son have been phenomenal. Yeah. They've sent us videos, they've sent us photographs, they've kept us up to date with what he's doing. They've done their level best to make sure we can get access to him. If we phone up and say, can we come and see him? They, they get him ready, bring him out to the gate and stuff. They've been looking after him. He's been safe. Everybody in that facility has been safe and well looked after, well treated. But they've lost so much. I mean, he's lost all the physio he used to get, all the trips out he used to get. When we drove him from his... Uh, care facility back to our flat for Christmas. That was the first time he'd been outside that facility since February last year. Yeah. Um, and I could see that he was just freaked out. I mean, in a good way, because suddenly there was all this sensory stuff going on around him. Um, but he's lost a lot. He's lost a lot of the, the therapies that used to be available to him and used to give his day meaning and used to give his day structure. Mm. Um, and that's put a lot of onus on the staff to keep him busy, to keep him active. Um, and again, they've done their best, but at first, you know, the, 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 the patients, the, the clients were basically just in their bedrooms. They weren't allowed to mix. They weren't yeah. allowed to mix in the, in the, 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 the kind of, you know, communal spaces in the dining room and everything else. Mm. Um, so it was a bit like being in solitary confinement and, you know, Kit was okay with that, but because he was getting looked after, he was getting one-on-one yeah. -on -one attention. But not everybody was. I mean, some of the, the, the clients were just couldn't understand why life was going on outside and they weren't part of it. And, you know, things that they'd just taken for granted, they weren't getting to do anymore. Like go to the football on a weekly yeah. basis, taken to the football. Uh, one guy gets taken by his parents to the football every week or every couple of weeks. That was lost completely. Going to church was lost for some of the clients completely. It was just, and, you know, there's no way of explaining to them what's going on. No. Um, so we're all in this, we're all in this limbo um, and we're getting a false sense of security that this vaccine is coming along and making us all safe and we can all go back to our normal lives again. But it's going to be a long, long time before that happens for certain people in society and the learning disabled just seem to be at the bottom of the list. Yeah. Um, and it is very frustrating. It's just a lack of information and a lack of joined up thinking. Yeah. You know, it just needs them to say, right, we're going to have one GP who's going to come into the care home and do all the clients. There's only 20 odd of them. There's 20 odd people in there who still need this job. Yeah. Um, and then let's let's fix it up. And if, if you need time to get your son or daughter, you know, ready for this, then we'll give you some time to get them ready. You can come in, get you in PPE um, and come, get in there so you can be there when it happens. None of that seems to be happening very quickly or very readily or at all, as far as I can make out. So it's just really, it's really frustrating. It is really frustrating for everybody. It is. And when you think of the numbers of disabled people in the UK and the numbers of um, learning disabled people, particularly, but also physically disabled people, it mm. just seems like, as you say, there's this huge demographic of people who are last on the list and yet have an incredibly high level of need. Mm. Can you, do you mind explaining what, because Kit has Angelman syndrome, doesn't he? Do you mind explaining how that um, presents yeah, or affects him? Angelman syndrome is, is quite a wide spectrum. I mean, there are Angelman syndrome people who can walk, Kit can, they can communicate, they can do signing to a certain extent or use technology to mm. communicate, Kit can't. 
he's very low on the spectrum, so he can't dress himself or feed himself, uh, do toileting, et cetera, et cetera. He's very dependent 24 seven on other people being around him to do that for him. He's in a wheelchair. Um, he can crawl, uh, but he, and he can walk in a walker to a certain extent where he's incredibly lazy. So he tends to put his feet up in the walker and let people push him around. Yeah. Um, the same on his trike. We've got a trike and he's, he's very reluctant to do much work when it comes to the trike. He's incredibly sociable, incredibly tactile. Big hugs and hair pulling is what you get from Kit. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, loves being around people. He's not introspective or anything like that. And we used to take him for long walks, you know, take him to the, the seaside and walk along the prom or something like that. Or there's a kind of hospital across from where he lives that has big wooded grounds and to right. just take a walk around there. So he's missing out on all of that. He's missing, and the, uh, you know, the staff would always take him to the local supermarket, um, the local waitrose, and he would do the shopping for the, yeah. you know, for the, for the home. Um, he's lost all of that. He's lost all interaction with, with human beings apart from the carers um, who are there with him 24 seven. Um, so we've been incredibly reliant on them and uh, but yeah, I mean the the some of the 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 clients in this home, um, their families live a long way away. They don't necessarily live in Scotland even. Mm. So it's been incredibly tough when you think of he's he's so close to us, um, uh, Nikki, that we can walk to yeah. see him. He's a twenty minute walk from us, yeah. which is a godsend. But there was a time when travel restrictions meant if you were living five miles from Edinburgh, you couldn't come into Edinburgh to see your uh, to, to see your son or daughter. Yeah. Um, so families that are further afield, especially when the weather's bad as it is just now, there's a lot of snow on the ground, the roads aren't necessarily safe, so families can't even get in if they want to. Mm. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Mm. Um, and as you say, with for a lot of families, they're, they're, they're hundreds of miles away. And um, we're in the same situation as you. We're very lucky, and it, in our case, took a fight to get Emily very, very local to us because you, you need that. You need to be able to maintain those contacts. And with Emily, she lives in her own property, but she has three to one support mm. workers with her 24 hours a day. But it means that twice a week, we like you can go and wave through the window. And we were lucky because we were able, Emily loves FaceTime. But again, mm -hmm. that's not the case for everybody. Um, so I think, as you say, it, it, it's this lack of thought, this lack of appreciation that that not all families are the same and that the emphasis I think, and obviously rightly to some degree, but that just every interview I see, um, the emphasis is on elderly people as though the only people in receipt of social care or any kind of um, residential life outside of the home or their own home are, mm. are elderly people. And that does frustrate me. Um, yeah, it's like care, care homes are, are now equated with the elderly. Yeah. Um, and trying to say to people, no, no, there are an awful lot of care homes out there for young adults mm. uh, who really are vulnerable, uh, clinically vulnerable, and yet they're being completely forgotten about. And, you know, it just, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is. I know that, you know, the parents of, 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 of um, children and, and adults with, with learning difficulties with special needs are used to fighting. <laughs> we're used to fighting the bureaucracy. We're used to the red tape. We're used to just banging the table and banging people's heads together and, and becoming almost lawyerly in our ability to get through red tape and get through form filling and everything else and fight to get the stuff that our children need, that our loved ones need. Mm -hmm. um, but with COVID, it's different. You're kind of fighting something that's, a, you're fighting a pandemic. You're not just fighting local government. You're not just fighting the, the care services. Um, social workers and the like, it's not them. You know, it's the, the our, our son has been kept away from us for a good reason. Yeah. Protect him from a virus that could well kill him. Yeah. Um, and you've got to appreciate that. I think you've got to appreciate, you hope that the, as in your situation, you hope that the caregivers are, are empathetic uh, and and will give your loved ones the, 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 the attention and the love that they need while you're not available to do it. Uh, and you're not available to do it because you're saving their lives, probably, mm. or perhaps. Mm. So it's, you know, it's been hard and, and it will continue to be hard for quite a while. I mean, we probably won't get the job, i.e. 60 to 65 year olds, me and Kit's mum won't get the job until 
I don't know, March, April, May. And so he'll probably be in the same group as us. So he won't get it till March, April, May. Uh, so possibly by the summer, we'll be able to actually go out and take him for a walk and start to do some of the things that we took for granted. Mm -hmm. Some of the activities might not come back again. Uh, some of the charities that have been looking, you know, have been yeah. given stuff giving them time and attention might have gone to the wall by then or might have decided they cannot do social distancing and social distancing will become a permanent part of some activities so who knows what's going to be available and what won't be available that's the next fight waiting for us yeah um once the pandemic has calmed down yeah and i think it's also probably useful as well to speak to so that people really understand why vaccination for learning disabled people is so important if you could talk a little bit about, you know, we've had the mortality review figures coming in for learning disabled people. And if you could just talk a little bit about what learning disabled people are facing in terms of this pandemic. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you've, you've, you've been very active on social media trying to make people aware of this. Um, through that, I've become a little bit more active on social media mm -hmm. than, than was previously the case. Um, and that's meant that people, you know, sort of various radio stations and media outlets have become a bit more interested. Yeah. Um, and that's all to the good, but it's a bit late now. It's getting, t it's a bit late in the day. I mean, we could have done with that attention a year ago, um, mm. 10 months ago, we could have done with that attention, which would maybe have focused the minds of the legislators um, uh, and, and the kind of social uh, authorities that, that this is needed, that, that, that this, this that this should be the focus. Um, so yeah, it's maybe too late, but uh, you, you hope that people learn, you hope that the, 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 the authorities learn from mistakes. I think it seems to be a very British thing is that we always screw it up early on. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we sort of scramble around and we eventually sort of make a fist of it, yeah. uh, a half decent fist of it, you hope. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly been the case with, with this virus. And, you know, you can criticise the government all you like, but the rollout of the vaccination has been pretty phenomenal, I think. Mm. Uh, internationally speaking, it's been pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, let's hope that it works. Yeah. Let's Absolutely. hope that it takes and that there aren't side effects. Um, I mean, Kit's fine with needles. I mean, you know, he's, he's, I don't think that would be an issue for him at all. No. Um, and I wouldn't have any qualms about him getting the vaccine no. um other parents might they might think well what's the potential side effects we don't know the side effects yet this hasn't been tested it's been tested on healthy volunteers has it been tested on people with, with medical conditions yeah um not that i know of and i guess the thing is I it, understand that some families might be a little bit worried yeah and 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 justifiable concerns i think everybody can can appreciate and understand that and that's an, an entire distinct difference to people who are deliberately saying that nobody should be vaccinated for the strangest and most bizarre reasons as we know um, yeah, but the reality <laughs> is if you have a learning disability you are six times more likely to die and have learning disabled people have been dying at six times the rate and if you are the age of of kit and emily in in our case uh you're 30 times more likely to die and I think yeah. this is why it's it's vital. I mean, vaccines are life, and um, and why it's so important, and why we're fighting. I guess all of us um, to make sure that 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 is factored into government thinking. And again, as you say, it's not a it's not a political thing. You know, good healthcare isn't a, a political thing, and calling for it, it shouldn't have to be. Mm. but also reminding people of the responsibilities that go with the, the role that they have, I think is really important, which is why I am so grateful um, that you're speaking out about it, because I think it's often seen as an issue that's lower down the list of priorities um, in talking about clinical vulnerability, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. I agree mm. entirely. Ian... Thank you so much. And I do apologize for the technical <laughs> no problem, that, no. that happened at the start, but I am so grateful that you talked to me today. Um, no, and maybe we can talk again. Yeah, um, let's hope so. Let's hope yeah. so. And, uh, and good luck. Good luck. Thank you. And to you. And to Kit. <laughs> Thank Bye you. Now.